You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the writer and broadcaster, Amy Nicol Turner, and the barrister, Andrew Eborn. Welcome to both of you. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you, first of all. The Sunday Express reports that amongst the measures to be unveiled at this week's Conservative Party conference will be a financial aid package of more than a billion pounds aimed at reviving Britain's rundown high streets. The Sunday Times leads with a story on uh, Kemi Badenoch piling the pressure on Rishi Sunak to quit the European Convention on Human Rights. The Observer has an exclusive poll of Tory voters with 34% intending to switch their votes to other parties. The Sunday Mirror has a special report on Somalia's forgotten children as 1.5 million of them are reported to be facing extreme hunger as the nation is gripped by its worst ever drought. The Sunday Telegraph reveals that Defence Secretary Grant Shapps is discussing the possibility of deploying British troops to Ukraine for the first time. And The Sun leads with the news that Downton Abbey star Hugh Bonneville has split from his wife of 25 years. Well, a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Amy Nicole Turner and Andrew Eborn. Welcome again to both Lovely of to you. you. And you both. Let us start with the um, front page of the Sunday Times and this story um, in the headline uh, making mention of, of Kemi Badenoch. And she apparently has said that leaving the European Convention on Human Rights needs to be put on the table, uh, pressure mounting on Rishi Sunak. And absolutely also saying it's not racist to discuss leaving the convention. It's one of these sort of hot things and basically we need to turn around and say, well, OK, if we don't do that, what are we going to do in its place? And I think that's what they're talking about. They talked about within the Sunday Express, they talk about these new five policies they're going to have, one of which is to re reduce immigration by halving the number of visas being awarded uh, to migrant workers and foreign students and their families. And I think it's always one of these very emotive subjects, isn't it, when you're talking about quitting the ECHR, because you've then got to turn around and say, well, what are we going to replace it yeah. with? Uh, because it's not just in a vacuum. You need to look at both sides of the story. However, it's becoming increasingly popular to talk about leaving the ECHR. And in fact, I think most people don't really understand what underpins it. This was signed in by Churchill, who by Tory party standards is one of their absolute heroes, you would have thought. But on the Tory right, it's increasingly popular to discuss leaving this. But the key thing is, it underpins the Good Friday Agreement. It underpins the power that we have as individuals to challenge the state. So this, to me, just seems like an absolutely extreme way of getting around what is basically to warrant deporting 200 traumatised people against their will to Rwanda. Yeah. It seems incredibly disproportionate. And I think the reason Kemi's decided to bring this up now is because, well, it was the night before Tory conference, yes. is it not? I and I think there is a possibility that this is going to become a leadership pitch for her. And she sees this as an, a quick way to please the right wing of the party, please the voters, but also concern the Tory moderates well, and concern and a right. lot of people who have very valid oh, no, problems they are, they are very valid. With, with leaving the ECHR. And, and what's happened as well is obviously people are just reminded all the time of Rishi's five-point pledge, which is sort of reducing the boats and so on and so forth, which is one of the key things there. What I found interesting as well, which is in the Times, but it didn't make the front page, surprisingly, is um, that Jeremy Hunt let slip uh, in a, an off-mic moment, which he didn't realise was being recorded, uh, when he thought the next election would be. And he was sort of turning around and saying, well, when inflation gets below 3%, uh, that's when we're going to call an election, and that's predicted to be around autumn time. So that, that, we can that, all be surprised so when that happens. Yeah. Would you, the cat out of the there is a yes. lot of political manoeuvring going in, on at the moment, like these policies being thrown out that they just know are like red meat. So I reckon after conference, we'll get a whole smorgasbord of this populist, let's face it, bit of nonsense. Um, and then maybe an election? Red just meat to the red wall and, and, and the red corduroy. Oh, but is it really? Sam Coates was saying that it's more or less a beauty parade at conference for yes. people vying for uh, position should Rishi Sunak be ousted. 
Yes. Yeah, and I think the likes of Suella Braverman, who this week has gone completely against Rishi Sunak, he's already condemned what she said in Washington. She's going to be putting herself right at the front of that list this conference. Mm, we shall see. Let's uh, move on to the uh, Telegraph and uh, this story about uh, Grant Schatz and plans for troops, British troops in Ukraine, Andrew. It's, it's always a bit shocking when you have a headline like that, isn't it? Did it did make us jump, didn't and, it? And what you need to do is look beneath the headline which mm. is all about actually yeah. he's going to train, he's going to send some people over to train the military on the ground and the Navy may move into the Black Sea as well. So we need to look at those particular uh, details rather than just the scary bits about the headlines saying going to send troops to Ukraine because that would be horrendous. Uh, on, on, a, on a major sort of political basis. However, Ukraine currently have support. Biden sent the planes. Germany has given 2.4 billion in arms. We've sent arms, but we are in fact going to be the first to send troops, but crucially, troops to train the Ukraine yes. personnel. Um, but I think anything less than this, to me, is an insult to Ukrainian civilians. And, you know, we, James Cleverly, has previously um, insisted that the UK will defend Ukraine until it is victorious. So I think this is just the next logical step, really. Mm. Um, their security is our security. This is an invasion on Western democracy. So I think the West have to come together to do everything they can. But Andrew, you, you think that the, that the headline is misleading? Well, it is misleading because when you say yeah. send UK troops to Ukraine, you think, you think they're going to be engaged in battle. Yeah. And that just takes it to a completely Mm. different level and is wrong. I think it is misleading on that basis. They are training in the same way as people have been giving weapons and so on and so forth. We're not the ones firing the weapons and we're not the ones sending in the troops to fight. I think that's the important point. And, and I think sometimes it, it, it's this inflammatory language that yeah. can be quite damaging. And often what you find with, with, with papers is you get the people who write the headlines are not the ones who write the copy. So uh, there's a disconnect. There, there is a disconnect. So I, we I, saw I this saying. outside and we said, what? Yeah, yes. exactly. Until you read the right. actual yeah. article. Yes. Uh, note to uh, everybody. Note <laughs> <Don't> to <you> editors. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Don't give us a heart attack. Um, the Express next, I think, this story about uh, flagging high streets that Rishi Sunak is um, looking uh, to help out now. Don't you think this is hilarious? Rishi Sunak levelling up forgotten towns. Who forgot them, Rishi? The Conservatives are quite forgetful, aren't they, right? So why are they derelict? Could it be your 13 years of underinvestment or maybe austerity? Basically, starve the high street of all resources. Um, I saw a poll today which said how good are job opportunities under the Conservatives, a YouGov poll, and 68% of people agreed that they're very bad. Yeah. So I think this is too little. Mm. Too Andrew, late. is he, he talking about correcting a, a problem that um, the Conservatives have created? Well, it's, it is interesting. I, I'm never really a fan of polls because it depends on how you phrase the question and who you ask on that, yeah. on that sort of basis. So, uh, lies, damn lies and statistics, they always <laughs> say, don't they? Um, you're absolutely right. Work needs to be done. He talks about 55 run-down places. But who run them, them down? Well, he I... broke them. Now he's doing fiscal peanuts to, to fix them. Well, it, it's you, ridiculous. It, the devil, as always, is going to be in the details. So they're talking about some quite large figures, a billion lifelines for Derek. Is that, la that large? Well, it depends on how it's spent, doesn't right. it? 55 run-down towns that they run down, and now they're going to fix them with a one billion cash boost. Well, I think one, one of the biggest problems we have in society at the moment is the lack of community. And, and some of these things don't necessarily take a huge amount of money. It's more about a mindset. Mm. And basically, you've got a lot of people where we had the TikTok uh, riots, if you like, inspired by uh, around Oxford Street by TikTok and, and people like Mizzy and so on and so forth. Basically, people are looking for role models. And the role models they're finding at the moment are bad role models. Mm. What we need to do is basically change that mindset. But it's going to take a lot more than cash to do that. It's going to take investment in education. It's going to take investment in providing people with opportunity and aspiration, which they currently don't have. Mm. Um, to but that all that. takes money as well. Well, yeah. and, <laughs> and for the sense of community as well, it's also a mindset. And so it's not just cash. It's the sort of mindset where we need good heroes as opposed to a sort of negative influence. And there are people out there, I know. And so that's what we need to do is shine a spotlight on them in the media to make that make sense. OK, let's move to another poll that you're not a fan of. Uh, this one's saying that a third of <laughs> Tory voters plan to switch allegiance. Amy? A third of Tory voters swan, sw uh, plan to vote differently in the next election. Now, my thoughts on this are, could it be something to do with the priorities? So at the moment, we're hearing a lot 
from the government about immigration, but we're not hearing much about what they would do to fix, which is the number one concern, the cost of living crisis, closely followed by health. And if you look at health, one of Rishi's pledges was to cut NHS waiting lists. 87% of people disagree that he's done that and think he's doing very badly at that. So I think that's why people want to swap their vote. They're not seeing anything materialise. No, none, of, none of the pledges um, have, have we even seen remotely fulfilled. Mm. So I don't think this is surprising, really. Well, but I, it's just where are they going to swap their vote well, to? I, I, I think that's right. Because I think most people don't, are reluctant. The, the, Tory, the, real, uh, the real grassroots Tories they don't really want to go to Labour. So could this mean a boost in the Liberals? Well, I think what's going to happen, this is why you have these headline sound bites mm. and a, a fairly easy sort of list, which is why the Jeremy Hunt leaked audio was so interesting, mm. is you know that inflation, when it was originally, what, 11.1%, wasn't it, when Rishi made that pledge to halve it, which was not a very ambitious And isn't uh, really motion. in his control anyway. And, and you work on that sort of frame. So you're going to get these headlines. Reducing a big fan, a fanatic for things like artificial intelligence, for reducing waiting lists, and they talk about using technology for those sort of things. So make the headlines really dramatic and say this is a big problem and then basically what's going to happen is it's going to drip feed those solutions all the way through. So, for example, using AI has made certain things incredibly efficient in terms of reducing... a lot of people hear AI business. and imagine job losses... And, and you're right, 300 million is well, what Goldman Sachs said, but you need to work out there are positive things on well, as well with AI. And we are discovering seismic changes in medicine, in the way that things were advances. There have been cures for all sorts of diseases. Sure, but, but definitely result. pros and cons with, yes. with, with AI. Amy and Andrew, for the moment, thank you. We're going to take a break. Coming up, uh, we'll look at uh, claims that the Department for Education is keeping secret files on its critics. Uh, more on that when we come back. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Amy Nicole Turner and Andrew Eborn. And uh, we're going to start this section by having a look at the front page of The Observer. And this um, sort of cloak and dagger story, the Education Ministry keeps secret files on critics of schools policy. Shocking, isn't it? And, and this intriguing. is off the back of uh, journalists who said the similar sort of thing, that they've been having their social media being monitored. And the experts, quite rightly, are demanding to see these dossiers because apparently the Department of Education, they've tried to cancel unsuitable speakers. I think we need to know what's going on, mm. what's being monitored and why it's being monitored. Well, I think we know why it's being monitored. But first of all, this is costing taxpayer money to do this. Um, it's being monitored because, of course, the critics are quite a lot of them at the moment. I mean, at, we used to say the education um, sector was crumbling, but now it literally is crumbling mm. because of the rack concrete scandal. That paired with um, seeing ministers constantly saying, We've, we're spending more than ever on schools, when actually, of course, yeah, there's more pupils than ever, and you're spending significantly less per pupil. Um, there's a lot of um, emphasis in this also on them keeping tabs on, on the early years and when you should start assessing children, which which is something that um, a lot of educational experts say isn't good for children, but policy and popularity, the politicians don't really want to go near that. So they've been silencing these critics um, to, to, to keep this out of the public domain. Well, the, the um, article saying at least nine experts have uncovered files held on them, some as long as they're 60 pages. pages. Yeah. But, but to what? The question has to be to what end? Yes. Well, and also in the fact that it's been told to them, they're obviously no longer a secret. Mm. The fact, if you tell somebody they're being watched, it means they're going to be slightly more cautious as to what they say and so on and so forth. With all of these things, what I love about this show is we like to shine more light and less heat on the topic. You've got a, a massive headline again saying, keep secret files on this. It sounds very sort of mm. Eastern European in the bad old days and so on and so forth. You need to work out why this has happened. And as I said, there was a similar story not so long ago about journalists. And basically they were having their social media monitored and so on and so forth. And these files were being kept on them. You need to work out to what end. But, but is it to, is well, it to is, silence them or something it's else? It's because they're being critical of government policy. 
And nobody wants to be seen, especially at this time of uncertainty, when so many people are unhappy with the education sector. They want to keep as much criticism in the bottle as they possibly so can. So the question is this, free then, speech, what happens... democracy? Yeah, it's oh, free of speech. course, it's awful. It shouldn't be happening at all. Well, the question is, what do they do with that information? Mm. And the suggestion is that some of them have cancelled what they classify as unsuitable speakers. Now, if that's the case, we need to know... Yeah. Um, I mean, there was an extraordinary report, I don't know if you saw it, uh, which was done by the... Um, um, basically for the freedom of speech uh, within universities for the uh, yeah. and academics. And they worked out that 200 times as much is spent on EDI as it is on free speech. And you have all sorts of obligations under the Human Rights Act and so on and so forth to make sure that you have freedom of speech touted in the right sort of way, whilst at the same time ensuring that you do cover various other things as well. Well, let's move to a, a similar story, which I don't know if this is a worrying trend. Uh, this is on the front page of The Telegraph, and this one regarding um, Labour and them wanting to um, also seemingly silence critics. It, it is strange, isn't it? They're sort of talking about Labour law of lawfare targets private schools critical of the VAT raid. And we need to put this into perspective. Is school fees, and a lot of people will save a huge amount of their income to put their children with a possible better start in life. That it's not these big, big well, schools minute, which cost a lot of fortune. It's not a huge amount because ninety-three percent of, of of students will go to a state school, so it's actually well, well, that, a huge amount of money. I'm oh, not, not, not yeah, as a percentage. Yeah, but so, we are still talking so about. So a lot of families will be saving that. If you put an extra 20% on top of that, the reality is, when we look behind the headline, which I need to do, you look behind that, it's going to finish a lot of those sort of things. A lot of those schools which are just on the, the, the balance won't be able to do it. A lot of families who've got this aspirational, we'll save up our money because we want our children to go to these places, won't be able to afford it. That's the scandal of it. And I think that's the thing. So <laughs> people being cr critical of that, we need to know why they are mm. and look at those facts and figures. And I think it's estimated that it would affect about 40,000 children. And... Um... I know, I, I know in my heart that the policy is probably right, but I can't help but think that those 40,000 children who have already had their education disrupted by COVID are going to have their education disrupted again. And it's not going to touch wealth, it's going to touch income again. Because the people who are paying for those school fees term to term will be the ones that can't save up and pay ahead or, or just do the 20% on top. So I don't think it's getting better the wealthiest, which surely is the point of any policy like this. Well, People that can afford And it. The, the, the crux of the, the issue is it, it's not only the wealthy who send their children no, to yes. this school. No, this is going to affect many people who, you know, really sacrifice yeah. in order to be able to and, send And it's totally to that. School. It's a sacrifice. And if you have to put an extra 20% on, they're no longer going to be able to afford to make that sacrifice. And that's what you need to do. So the mission, they say, part of the mission is to put more money into the education However, sector, and it may not work. I Let's just have a quick look at the, uh, the Matt Carlton. Oh, I love this. Oh, oh, <laughs> so we've only got about so 30 seconds. This, so he says, if you can get expelled from your private school uh, before the next election, there's 50 quid in it for you. <laughs> I love it. It's got to be good. Matt is brilliant at encapsulating just the right thing. Always brilliant. Thank you very much for the moment, Amy and uh, Andrew. Lovely to end on a Matt cartoon. You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the writer and broadcaster, Amy Nicole Turner, and the barrister and futurist, Andrew Eborn. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Sunday Express reports that amongst the measures to be unveiled at this week's Conservative Party conference will be a financial aid package of more than a billion pounds aimed at reviving Britain's rundown high streets. The Sunday Times hears that the business secretary, Kemi Badenoch, wants Rishi Sunak to quit the European Convention on Human Rights. The Mail on Sunday quotes the Home Secretary criticising celebrities such as Sir Elton John who have expressed their views on the government's migration policies. According to The Observer, the Department for Education is keeping secret files concerning the social media activity of critics of its policies. The Sunday Telegraph reveals that uh, Defence Secretary Grant Schatz is discussing the possibility of deploying British troops to Ukraine for the first time. The Sunday People carries tributes to teenage victim Eliane Andam, focusing particularly on her love of dancing. 
The Sunday Mirror has a special report on Somalia's forgotten children, as 1.5 million of them are reported to be facing extreme hunger as the nation is gripped by its worst ever drought. And The Sun leads with the news that Downton Abbey star Hugh Bonneville has split from his wife of 25 years. A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Amy Nicole Turner and Andrew Eborn. Welcome back to both of you. Lovely to see you again. And first Thank task, you. as we have been asked, you need to describe succinctly what a future, a future is. is. Basically, yeah, I work with companies around the world telling them what's going to happen in the future. So we look at technology, we learn lessons from history, and so on and so forth. So I'm a big advocate of things like artificial intelligence. This explains your obsession with so it, it does. It is absolutely. what it says on the tin. I, it, totally what it says Looking on the tin. The I make people lots of money by predicting the future. <laughs> right, let's, let's uh, crack on with the, the papers now. Um, so the Times front page, uh, Kemi Badenoch is the, the subject of the headline there, and uh, she's wanting Rishi Sunak to uh, quit the European Convention on Human Rights, we read. Amy, take us into this. So it's become increasingly popular, hasn't it, to say, right, we can't deal with this migrant crisis, so we need to leave the ECHR without really properly appreciating what the ECHR does for us. So set up by Winston Churchill post-World War II to protect us from the state. And what atrocities could happen would never be repeated again from World War II. Crucially, it underpins things like the Good Friday Agreement, so it threatens peace in Ireland. Um, we would be the first to voluntarily leave. Now, let's put this into perspective, right? We're leaving to send 200 people to Rwanda, PS, that has a returns agreement, so we get 200 people back. There are currently 47,500 people stagnating in hotels. 16% of those people are children. And they think this is going to solve the issue. To me, this is just red meat to the Red Bull Tories who, who want to see more policies like this, because I don't really, and I know this could sound patronising, I don't really think people appreciate how important the ECHR is. And, and it's talking about that appreciation because you're not going to do it in a vacuum. You're not going to say, that's it. You're going to replace it with something which would be more efficient. You have words like Rwanda, which basically become a bad word, because millions, we looked at the figures earlier, have been spent on a policy that has not worked. And what I'm always reminded of is Rishi's five-point plan uh, and how many of those he's going to get in time for the election. And as I said earlier, and it's somewhere else in the Times, not on the front page, Hunt, in uh, a candid interview, he didn't know his microphone was on, let slip that they're predicting the next election is going to be when inflation gets below 3% or around 3%, which he thinks will probably be in autumn time. Uh, what this is, it's all to do. It's headline grabbing to go back to those five points. I hours. think it's headline grabbing because Kemi Badenoch is pitching herself. She's going to use conference over the, over the coming few days to put it out there that she has leadership potential, mm. but it's by That's appealing. definitely what the, the article's it's... suggesting, that, that she's wanting to, to outmanoeuvre Suella Braverman. But caving to the Tory right and potentially upsetting the moderates. I, so... I think it's a very interesting point, because they're saying they, if, if they assume they may not get the next election, then they're looking about who might be the next leader. And mm. I think making those points... But it's like they're trying to out way, very right each other. Mm. all the time. But she's the second cabinet minister in a week to float the idea because Sloel Braverman uh, said on Tuesday that Britain might leave the ECHR if the court in Strasbourg um, thwarted the plan to deport yes, that, that, absolutely. migrants to, to Rwanda. Because you, you need the answer. You turn around, and it's so easy to turn around and say, well, we've been blamed for this, this was our plan, but we've been stopped, mm. so we have to get rid of it. It also won't work. It won't even touch the sides sending 200 people to Rwanda with a backlog of 47,000. But is there anything, I mean, a question that, that, that you've raised, is there yes. anything that, or any suggestion of what a replacement might be? Well, they do. They talk about these, and we're going to come on to this, this new Tories plan. Do you want me to deal with that now? Because uh, there's, there's a couple of things. They're setting out this Yeah, let's move on to the, point the, the plan, and we'll come back to uh, the celebrity points. But, but basically, what they're saying is there's this new five-point plan, which they're going to replace Labour's European rights and equalities law with a British framework for rights and freedom. That's what we're talking about there. Uh, they're going to cut taxes for families, small businesses and entrepreneurs. Any costing um, for that? Well, this is the, this is, this is the really? head Headlines. Again, you need mm. the devils in the detail. They're going to reduce immigration by halving the number of visas awarded to migrant workers, foreign students and their families. Right. Um, Again, 
How realistic is that? We're going to cut half our workforce. The NHS is it's how many? 38% is run by migrant workers. Foreign students prop up our university sector, which is probably one of our greatest exports. So they're going to they're going to. Um, completely bulldoze the two of our proudest institutions, right? Carry on. Yeah, there's some devils in the detail, mm -hmm. as, as you say. <laughs> Look at that sort of... Uh, don't blame the messenger. <laughs> it's it's going to be good. Uh, stop students who fail their A-levels from getting taxpayer-funded loans to attend universities and invest in, in apprenticeships instead. Now, that's got to be a great policy where you're basically encouraging apprenticeships and so on and so forth. Taking uh, away the choice of university. And, and, and of people. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and look at that sort of stuff. But if they're, they're saying you'll be wasting money if you're basically getting them off... Uh, well, uh, the that depends ladder. on what you value, doesn't it, really? Because you might not go to university to necessarily financially recoup afterwards. You might go for other reasons. Well, There's plenty more to university. If you're training people for a job that they could eventually get at the end of it, I'm fully in favour of real learning, if you like, which learns a trade. So the idea of apprenticeship has got to be good and worth looking at. I mean, that's something that, that, that Rishi Sunak has been pushing, that the, the, yeah. the degree should be relevant to future exactly. employment. But then yeah. it removes the from the equation that people that might want to study philosophy oh, no, or, and, and or philosophy theology. Is, or... Philosophy is very important. That's but, what but, I studied, in fact. No, no, that, <laughs> this is why a perfect example is why it's so good. Um, but the point about it is, is that they, he's saying a lot of people coming out of university in debt with no prospect of getting a job and therefore in a terrible situation. But so it, it's worth looking at. But, but however, the, it's only taxpayer-funded loans. So those with parents who can pay them through university, they will still be able to study anything they want. So then the arts sector will presumably become even more out of reach for even more people. And, and AI will help because they're going to help with all sorts of jobs, as we say beforehand. Um, and the, other, the one final fifth point, they say, is ban gender ideology in schools and ensure parents' rights to oversee sex education that the children receive. Now, that's a sort of hot topic on that sort of thing. So Indeed. those are their five-point plans, each of which we could spend a long time unpacking, and rightly so. So the devil is in the detail. OK, but let's move on. Uh, we'll come back to the, the migration uh, story, and, and how, let's have a look at the mail. And uh, apparently, Suella Bravman is... Um, telling celebrities, certain celebrities, to uh, pipe down in, in terms of sharing their views on uh, her migration policies. Well, that's right. She's talking about Sir Elton John and Gary Lineker, branding them as members of the virtue signalling elite. Also um, known as the truth. Well, so, Elton John, um, I think Suella thinks she's become a bit of a celebrity lately, actually. <laughs> Jetting off to Washington to show off in America, leaving Oliver Dowden to go do her work. Anyway, um, so Elton John has come out and said that she legitimised hate and violence by um, basically weaponising LGBT people in her argument of why she can't deal with the migrant crisis. Um, just to point out that she claims people are, are pretending to be gay as a basis of an asylum claim. Now, sexual orientation accounts for the basis of 1% of all asylum mm. claims, 1%. Um, also, she keeps pushing this idea that many asylum seekers game the system. Now, when she was challenged by her own Home Affairs Committee, she could evidence only four examples of this. So, she does talk a lot of exaggerated nonsense. Yeah. And I also think it's, it's not fair on the celebrities as concerned just to rubbish them by saying it's virtual signalling. Mm. Uh, so Elton makes a brilliant point. Exactly. Actually, you do need to look at that. Uh, Gary Lineker, to his credit, and new rules and regulations about It reminds me of when people say. say, oh, if only footballers could only stick to football, well, then we wouldn't have the school meals that Marcus Everybody's Rashford. entitled to a view. Absolutely. And got a very valid criticism as well. As we always say, jaw, jaw, not war, war. Let's shine more light on it and less heat. Let's quickly look, we've um, got about a minute to have a look at The Telegraph and uh, Grant Shapps' uh, announcement regarding troops, uh, British troops, uh, to be sent to Ukraine. Right, this one made us jump, didn't it? Well, it was a misleading headline, uh, and I really object to it. I, when you talk about sending UK troops to Ukraine, you think you'll be firing the weapons and things mm. like that. That's not the story. What really is happening is they're going there to train people, so it's part of the yeah. su continued support, supplying weapons and training is what's But happening. we will be the first to actually send troops to help their troops. Whereas, you know, Biden sent planes, Germany's given 2.4 billion in arms. We've previously sent arms, but we will be the first to actually assist in this way. Mm. And there were also talks about uh, Britain's Navy, what role they could play in defending commercial vessels from uh, Russian attacks in, in the Black Sea. So, yes, the detail is quite important to it's read on, really on that story. Amy and Andrew, thank you very much for the moment uh, coming up.
The government department is accused of keeping secret files on the social media activity of its critics. We'll discuss that next. Welcome back. Uh, still with me, we have Amy Nicole Turner and Andrew Eborn for our final run out. Our final run. Um, let's have a look at the Observer in this story about the Department of Education monitoring um, its critics, their social media activity, and what they have to a say. A very worrying story about keeping secret files on uh, critics of school policy. Uh, the experts are demanding to see these dossiers, some of which are 60 pages long, and so on and so forth. It follows a story fairly recently about journalists who were in a similar position where they had lots of their social media being monitored. Um, and apparently the Department of Education tried to cancel what they classified as unsuitable speakers. Uh, it's all sort of... It doesn't smell right, does it? If you're turning around and say people who are critical, if they're under extra surveillance, what's going on there? Yeah, mm. there, there were examples of, of, of experts being invited to debates and then their invites being rescinded, so then they were a bit suspicious about why this might be. But it's because they were found to be critical of government policy, which is surely the point of inviting an education expert into the Commons to discuss it. But I feel like at the moment, you know, there is so much wrong with the Department and Education. Recruitment and retention, terrible. We've got 25% of children who just aren't going to school at the moment. And these need to be addressed. And they're not going to be addressed if only those who aren't critical of the government are invited to discuss it. And that's it. the worrying one. People say it's secret, but why has it come out? Is it to scare people off? Mm. If so, don't be scared off. We should look at these sort of things. And what's the reason for collecting the data? Well, that's again, the exactly that. And, and you look at these sort of things. The, the alumni for free speech um, did a freedom of information request to about 50 universities, and they found out that 200 times as much is spent on equality, uh, diversity and inclusion as it is on free speech. And you need to look at those mm. sort of stats. Why is that? What's happening here? And make sure the balances are right. But the incredible thing is that it's taxpayer money which is funding this type of thing for them withholding the information that had to come from somewhere. OK, let's uh, move on to the Express and um, talk about Nadine Dorries, the former Culture Secretary. She's got a, a book um, coming out, oh, uh, memoirs, yes. but uh, she doesn't want the government to, to have a look before it's... Uh, it's published, and that's normally the requirement, that it well, has it to be vetted by the government. You're right. So it's, this is the political assassination of Boris Johnson. Not dramatic at all. Not dramatic at the all. The title's very reasonable. So the rules are this, that ex-ministers are expected to hand over memoirs in case there's anything secret mm. and so on and so forth. What she's saying is, well, I'm not going to... And HarperCollins, who are the publishers, are basically saying, well, it's not a memoir, but it's a narrative uh, garnered from the testimony of multiple sources from Western. No, Spain. I know exactly what it is. It's a love letter. It's a love letter to <laughs> Boris Johnson. Let's be real. That's what it is. Would you have written it? No, I wouldn't have written a love letter to Boris Johnson. Absolutely not. <laughs> I'd never it's, have it's guessed, It's half baby. love letter, half, like, hate-filled speech against Rishi Sunak and the backstabbing that she perceived. It'd be interesting. But it's all... When you're talking about semantics, those are the rules. Them are the rules. So you've got to turn around and say, if it's a memoir, you've got to follow this procedure. I think procedure. it's the ministerial if it's code. Not, you work on that stuff. So, so, so if, do if we it's think a memoir... Do we think she memoir. will be made to hand it over? Well, if it's classified as a memoir. This is, this is the yeah, rule. But Nadine doesn't do what she's told. Well, she might have to, <laughs> if it's a memoir. We, we shall see, we shall see. Um, final story, just got time for uh, James Cleverly, the, the Foreign Secretary, and um, his newfound um, fondness Ab of uh, fab, exercising. Of, he's going with Tell his wife that. to the gym, isn't that extraordinary? And he's, he's lost some pounds as a result of it, so very healthy. And I think you wanted to talk about his facial hair. No, I've just observed over the past few months that he is a man who keeps up his appearance. And I heard that not only does he have a very... Um, robust abs routine. He also is um, dying his beard. Oh, yes, oh right. There yeah. you go. And that's how oh. he keeps staying looking so sharp and well, handsome. I, I think and I'm, I've heard also that he's in the bid for um, Tory leadership, so we might be seeing a bit more from him over the next few days. Interesting. Westminster gossip there. <laughs> and you've outed him regarding <laughs> his beard, which does look very dark in that photo. It does I have look to dark. Say. <laughs> so they, 
We're going to see be... more of him, but hopefully not the abs. There we'll might just be imagine some those. truth in that uh, that rumour, but the, the whole exercising routine has come about because he's obviously been wined and dined a lot with diplomatic dignitary. So it's the want of the the foreign secretary to put a little bit of weight on I around. Think the, there are the many area. dinners you have to go to, so burning off a few pounds with, when he goes to his, with his wife to the gym is a good idea. He's got a lovely, gorgeous wife, isn't he? He's looking good yeah. on it, and sh so is she. <laughs> Thank you very much, both Amy and Andrew, for taking us through the papers. Lovely Good to, to see, see you. you. Thanks so much. much.